The sun is setting on this generation of consoles. It's been nearly seven years, which is crazy. And I honestly, I honestly think this generation will go down as one of the greats. It hasn't been perfect, but I think people will look back on it very fondly. And it's all about the games. There's been a lot of them. More games than any other generation of varying degrees of quality. Generally, the best games rise to the top. But when there are so many games vying for your time, attention, and your hard-earned dollars, there will be games that just don't get the attention or recognition that they deserve. There's only so much oxygen in the room. But now that things are winding down, I feel like we can look at these games through a different lens. Pretty much all these games can now be picked up for super cheap, they've had their final patches applied, we don't need to factor in hype or expectation, we can simply take these games for what they're worth. So today, we're going to take a look back at 10 games that, in my opinion, are either underrated or underappreciated. So there are games on here that just didn't sell well but were still very good games, and there's games on here that did sell well but I still feel didn't get the appreciation that they deserved. A couple other things before we start this list probably could have been compiled entirely of indie games, so instead we're going to focus on larger retail releases and two games that instantly come to mind, Titanfall 2 and Control. These games got so much love at this point that I don't think I would put them on the list, despite either of them not really selling very well. Play these games, seriously. And as always, these are all just my opinions. Whether you agree with them or not, that's too bad. Let's get started. The Order 1886. This game had nothing but bad press when it came out. All of it entirely having to do with the length of the campaign and not the quality of the game itself. I'm not of the mind that more equals better, but I also I can't argue with people who say that for $60 they want to have more than 4 hours of playtime. I get it. I understand. But now things are different. This game has been on sale for literally $4 on the PlayStation Store. Now that's a steal. The Order 1886, it's a third-person shooter set in an alternate history version of London. It's like, it's like Knights of the Round Table meets the Industrial Revolution, it's awesome. There's werewolves and other horror elements, and visually super ahead of its time. It still looks incredible. And while it's not perfect, there's a frustrating stealth section that I didn't like. It reuses a mid-game boss battle as the final boss, but the characters are great. The setting is unique, and there's some super satisfying weapons to use. And it also ends on a serious cliffhanger. Considering Ready at Dawn has been working on PSVR stuff, it's unclear if we'll ever see a sequel, but you never know. The biggest thing working against Mafia 3 is the incredibly un-Mafia-like setting and story. Like, why, why call it Mafia? Gone is the very Italian, Godfather-esque story, characters, and setting of the first two games. This game probably would have benefited from being called something else. However, Mafia name aside, that has nothing to do with the quality of the game itself. In fact, I love the story and the setting. It takes place in New Bordeaux, a city inspired by New Orleans in the 1960s. You play as Lincoln Clay, returning to New Bordeaux after serving in Vietnam. Mafia 3 is obviously inspired by GTA, except it's not quite as polished and it's smaller in scale. It certainly doesn't reinvent the wheel in terms of gameplay either, but its narrative is surprisingly engaging. It's definitely worth checking out for the story alone, plus the unique setting and the awesome soundtrack. Sure, the gameplay is not wholly original, but it's still fun and worth checking out. Gravity Rush 2, the sequel to the also underrated Gravity Rush 1, which was a PlayStation Vita game. This game's hook is immediate and apparent. It's all about gravity. The way you fight, the way you traverse, is by manipulating gravity. It's awesome. It's like flying, but it's like falling. So it has a very distinct sense of momentum and inertia and like lack of control. It's also just super addicting and satisfying. A game that succeeds in making it fun to simply move around, it's a great thing. These games are gems. I really like the style, the art, the characters, the soundtrack is fantastic. It all comes together in a pretty unique package that's unlike anything else out there. Cat returns as the main character, but also brings back Raven, who was the villain in the first game, who's now your ally, and they work together to take on a new threat. This game did not get the mainstream attention I think it deserves. The developer who made it, Team Gravity, formerly known as Team Siren, who interestingly made the horror series Siren, they've been silent ever since Gravity Rush 2 was released in 2017, so there's definitely a chance for more Gravity Rush in the future. 
released just a few months after Mad Max Fury Road, I'm honestly surprised that this game went as under the radar as it did. Probably because it was released on the exact same day as Metal Gear Solid V, not to mention the stigma for movie tie-in games, even though this game is not a direct tie-in to any of the films. It's an open world game with an emphasis on vehicular combat, and it's a ton of fun. Upgrading and modding the magnum opus Max's car was awesome. Plus, damn, this game looks amazing. Some people weren't in love with the game's on-foot segments. Personally, I didn't mind it too much. The hand-to-hand -hand combat definitely borrows a lot from the Batman Arkham series, and for me, it was fine. However, there's no doubt the game is at its best when you're driving through the open desert in the magnum opus with your trusty, hunchbacked assistant Chum Bucket taking on a group of raiders. It's awesome. This game knows what it is. It knows what people want from a Mad Max game. It's light on story and heavy on grimy, vehicular combat, open world, desert shenanigans. It's great. I have been championing the Evil Within series for a long time. It's pretty much the only AAA big budget horror series out there right now, along with Resident Evil, both of which come from the same creator, Shinji Mikami. Mikami actually left Capcom a long time ago, and after serving as director on Resident Evil 4, he deviated from horror games for quite a while. But eventually he founded his own studio and released The Evil Within's 1 and 2, games that were a combination of horror and action. The games get super weird, super crazy. In the story, using this technology called STEM, your characters can basically enter the mind of another person, creating like a shared world. This leads to all kinds of crazy nightmare fuel monsters and settings. It's awesome. A really fascinating story and premise, like Inception meets Silent Hill. Plus, it's fun to play, which, I've said it before, making a game that's both scary and fun, it's a tough thing to balance. Now that the next project from Tango Gameworks was revealed as Ghostwire, it seems like The Evil Within is put on ice, at least for now, but it's definitely still worth checking out. Uh, oh, fuck. What the shit is that? I know what you're thinking, why is this game on here? Hell, FF15 sold like 9 million copies. But despite the game's sales, the reception was all over the place. Critics aside, this game seems to have been hit or miss, even with the core Final Fantasy fans. But when I played the game, I really fell in love with it. The game makes a lot of bold decisions, took a lot of risks, and I respect and I appreciate that a ton. You're locked into four characters, no more, no less, you can't choose your party. And because of this, you grow an attachment to these guys. Sure, they look like a boy band, but I couldn't help but like them. They really are what hold this game together. The themes of brotherhood and sacrifice, this game has got a feel. It's a hard thing to quantify. It's really different than any other game I've played, and I think that's why I appreciate it so much. It's Final Fantasy infused with a road trip with the boys. The Stand By Me cover by Florence and the Machine in the intro, it's classic. I knew at this point that this game would be something special and it delivered. Arcane Studios, these guys are like the kings of making awesome, unique shooters that nobody plays. <laughs> I feel bad saying that. It's clear how much work and how much creativity goes into designing their games, yet when it comes to sales, they always get trounced by other same old annualized shooters that do the exact same thing every single year. Case in point, 2017's Prey, like Bioshock in space or probably more accurately, System Shock in space. It's a first-person shooter with a huge emphasis on player's choice, abilities, and strategy. A lot of games claim to let players play the way they want to play, but Prey means it. You play Prey the way you want to pray. That's not right. And I love the idea of mimics, these enemies that can literally take the shape of anything and then surprise you with the jump scare. God damn. We all know Watch Dogs 1 was rough around the edges, had a lot of controversies, had way too much exposure pre-release, and despite the first game selling quite well, I feel like by the time Watch Dogs 2 was released, few people still cared about the franchise. But I'm a sucker, so I bought it day one anyways. And I was pleasantly surprised. I played the crap out of this game. It literally improved every aspect of the first. A better story, way better gameplay from the way vehicles felt to the gunplay, it had less of a douchey protagonist, and it had a much more interesting setting in San Francisco. I loved all the shenanigans you could get up to with the drone and hacking objects in the environment. Good fun. But the damage from the first game had been done and the sales were quite soft for Watch Dogs 2. But Ubisoft is taking another swing at it this year with Watch Dogs Legion. 
We'll see how that goes. Vampire is an action role-playing game all about choice, where you get to play as a recently turned vampire, Dr. Jonathan Reed. It's one of those games where you can get through most of it without killing a single person, or by killing everyone. It's awesome. It's rough around the edges, it's definitely not a super high-budget production, but it's fun, interesting, and I'm a huge sucker for horror, gothic-themed games. The early 20th century London setting is super cool. The game was made by developer Don't Nod Entertainment, a fairly new studio whose first game was another game that went fairly under the radar last gen, Remember Me. Apparently Vampire needed to sell 500,000 copies in order to break even. The game went on to sell over a million, so while it didn't set the world on fire, it did turn a profit. It's worth checking out, especially if you're a horror fan. I actually just finished this game a couple days before recording this, and it's because of this game that I actually wanted to make this video in the first place. Because when Days Gone came out, it received very lukewarm reviews. Despite this, I still wanted to check it out. So I waited both for it to get cheaper and for the game to receive some patches. And holy crap, did I enjoy this game way more than I was expecting. It's an open world zombie survival game where you play as biker outlaw Deacon St. John. Both thematically and gameplay wise, it definitely treads a lot of familiar ground. It's a hodgepodge of things that, to be honest, we've seen done in other games before. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Once this game had its teeth in me, I honestly, I couldn't put it down. It does admittedly take a little while to get going. I actually think the first act of the game is the weakest, but once you reach the Lost Lake camp, the game gets dramatically better, and it's here that you're introduced to the most compelling characters and storylines, and it's here that I really fell in love with the game. The patches to improve performance, and all of the free content updates that this game received, made me real glad that I waited to play it. It's honestly a shame because in its current state, I think the game is fantastic, and the game's review scores from the launch are not indicative of the current product. It's really a perfect example of how the current review structure for games just doesn't work anymore. But at the same time, now more than ever, the onus is on the developers to make sure that the game is as polished as can be when the game is released. Anyways, those are my picks for the 10 most underrated or underappreciated games of this generation. Let me know what your guys' picks are. Let me know if there's any games on here that I missed. And uh, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button because it really does help this channel out a lot. Thanks again. Peace.